So looking at the PARS dashboard, which we've set up, and especially in the browser, you can see we've got a bunch of different, well, in PARS they call them classes, but there's lots of different words which we could use to describe this. We could call it a table name, we could call it a class, we could call it an entity, we could call it a type, but essentially it's, it's a type of a thing. So we've created three types or three tables or three classes, depending on what you want to call it, called place, player and team. Now you can create a class just by clicking on this button. Just give it a name, let's call it Hello Pars. And then click create and now we've created a class. Now you can see it's got some columns here, some automatically created columns called object ID. This is generated by PARS automatically and it will be the unique identifier for each row in this class, each instance of this class. Then we also have the last time it was updated, the last time it was saved and the time it was created. And we have something called ACL which we'll go through later on. It stands for Access Control List. Now we can add new columns Again, there's multiple words which we could use to describe what a column is. So a column in the context of a table is one, well, one column. But this would also translate in the uh, PARS world in your client code as a field on an instance or an attribute of an instance. But we'll, that will become clear shortly. So let's just add a column here. So I'm going to add a column called foo and I'm going to give it a type of string. We can choose multiple different types we want the column to be. So we can choose string, boolean, which is true, false, a number, a date, time, an object, an array, what's called a geo point, which is a latitude and longitude, which we'll use for something called geospatial queries, which, which we'll cover in this course, a file, which is an uploaded file, a pointer, which just points to another instance of a class or another row in another table, and a relation, which is a way of linking one row to multiple rows in another table, or in fact, in the same table. But again, we'll go through pointer and relation later on. So I'm just gonna create a field called foo with just a type of string, and I'll create another one. So I'll go in there, add column. I'll create another one, perhaps of type um, file. And let's call that moo. And then if we wanted to, we could add a row, which is kind of create an instance of this class. And then I can go through here to the right, add some data for our string. Hello, hello. And then perhaps add a file as well. So double click, it will also bring up the, the relevant, the right way of updating that field. So because this is a file field, it's gonna bring us a file dialog. So I'm just gonna, just for the hell of it, upload a file. So there we go. And you can see it's also, when I first clicked out and uh, tabbed away from the foo, it actually saved it. So when it saved it, it created an, an object ID, which is, as I described, the unique identifier for this particular row. The last time it was updated, the last time, it, well, the time it was created, and something called an ACL. So that's in PARS how you can create a class or a table and how you can add columns to that table and also add records or instances of that class to that table. But if you remember from the script that you ran to bootstrap your PARS dashboard with the place, player, and team information, you first didn't have to go into the dashboard and create classes for each of those. And that's because as much as possible, PARS tries to automatically determine all of that for you. So when you try to save some data to PARS, it will try to automatically determine the class name. It will try to automatically determine the names of the columns you want for that class. Also automatically try to determine the data type you want for that column. From the first time you try to save an instance of something to parse. So let me show you with an example. So I've got a JS bin ready and waiting here. So this bin, the main thing in the HTML section is that it's, it's, it's loading up the parse latest.js. And actually for this one, we don't need jQuery. So let me 
get rid of that one. So all we need for this one is the PARS latest client library for JavaScript. So now open up the JavaScript console and let me get rid of the HTML one to give us some space. So the first thing we want to do is call PARS initialize and then give it the app ID. So I use the app ID, my app ID. And secondly, we want to set the server URL so it knows where our parse server lives. So let me just paste that in. So ours lives in code, craft example, Heroku app.com slash parse. Okay. Now to define a class in JavaScript using the parse JavaScript SDK, we need to use the extend function on the parse object class. So typically what you do, so let's say I want to create a class called post to represent like a post you put on the internet, like a blog post perhaps. I would type var post because it's a class, the convention is to give it a capital first letter. And then we do parse.object.extend and then we give it the name of the class that we want to create. So I want to create a name, a class called post. Okay. So this defines a class, a table in the parse dashboard to create an instance or a row in that table. We need to create an instance. So we do var post or, or anything. You can call it anything you want. I'm just going to call it lowercase post is equal to new and then post. Okay. So capital P post is the class or the table name. Lowercase p post is the instance or the uh, the row or a row in the post table. So that will just create an empty row. How do we actually add some data to this, some, some columns? So with these various mechanisms, I'm going to show you them all right now. The first one is you use the set function. So on the post instance, we have a function now called set. The first parameter is the name of the column. So let's call this first one body. And the second parameter is a value. So I'm going to say the body of this post is just some text. I'm going to say, hello, my name is Asim. So this is now going to create a column called body on the post table. And on this instance, for that column, this is going to be the value. Okay. Let's set some others. Let's do post.set. Um, Let's do tags. So posts tend to have tags. So remember, we can have an array data type. So I'm going to give some tags to this post. So I'm going to say first post and then perhaps welcome. And I'm also going to do one more set num comments. So the number of comments that this post has is zero. So here we go. So now we've kind of defined our post class. We've created an instance and we've set some data on that instance. Now remember, we haven't actually gone to the parse dashboard and created the class yet at all. We're only, we're only just writing some code in JavaScript. So what we want to do now is we want to save this post instance. So post.save is the function we want to call. The last thing I want to do is just to have a log line here. Fully saved post.id. Okay. Now let's open up the console and then let's just run this. Okay. So we've at least got the line 11 console log printed out, but it's actually saying successfully saved undefined. The thing it's saying is undefined is the post.id. So what is this ID? So when you save an object to the parse database or really to any database, the database itself gives that row, that instance, a unique identifier. And you can see this unique identifier from the ID property. This is equal to the object ID that you saw in the parse dashboard. So if an instance doesn't have an ID, it means it hasn't been saved yet. It hasn't been saved for the first time, it hasn't been created yet. So when this says successfully saved undefined, well, what that's really saying is that this, this post object hasn't been saved yet because the ID is undefined because the database hasn't actually given it an ID. 
To some of you, this might seem a bit confusing because on a line previous, we had actually said post.save. So what's going on? Now to understand what's going on here, we need to explain the, the concept that save is an asynchronous function. What does asynchronous mean? So one way to think about what asynchronous means or what an asynchronous function does is that an asynchronous function just starts the process. It just kicks it off. So in this case, post.save just starts the process of saving because the process of saving here involves sending a request to the parse server, the parse server doing some stuff and saving it to the database itself, and then responding to that request on the client side to say, hey, look, everything's saved. That might actually take some time. So what post.save does is it just kicks it off. It just sends that initial request to the parse server. It doesn't wait for that response to be returned from the parse server. It just sends it and then moves to the next line of code. So by this point, by line 11, we haven't, the parse server hasn't actually completed the save. It's probably only just started saving it. And that's why the post at this point doesn't have an ID. Now, asynchronous programming is actually very, very common in the world of, of web development or generally on the internet. And that's because most of the time on the internet, when you're writing code, you're writing loads of functions that are running off and performing network requests. Now, these requests might take some time to respond. And actually, it's okay. Your browser can sit down and send you know, hundreds of these requests off at a time simultaneously. If you had to wait for each and every request to send and return before moving to the next line of code, all of our applications would take so long to run. So what JavaScript does and what a lot of these languages do is they run asynchronously, which is to say they just kick up, they just kick off the process, they just send the network request, and then they don't wait for it to respond, and then they just move to the next line of code. But actually, we do quite often need to run functions or run code once we know that the save has completed, once we know that the asynchronous request has completed. One way parse gives us to run code after the post object has been saved into the database is via callbacks. So callbacks are just functions which you write which gets called back when the save function completes. So we define the callbacks in the second parameter to the save function. So we don't actually need the first parameter for this use case. So we're just gonna say, it, say it's null. The second parameter will be an object. And if it has a property called success, that will be a function that gets called when the post saves successfully. And if it has a property called error, that will get called if there's an error saving the post object. So now we've got that, let's move this up to here. So for the success callback, it also provides the object itself that got saved. So let's just use that to print it out, so object.id. And if there's an error, let's just print out, in an error, it also provides the error itself as the first parameter. So let's just do console.error, error. Okay, so now if I clear this and run again, so you can see on line 12, we print out successfully saved, but this time we have the actual ID of the object. So now we've run some code and we have access to the object, to the post object, after his, it has actually been saved on the parse server and returned to your code running in your browser. Okay, so that's one way in which we can call save. Now let me explain what this null parameter here is all about. So instead of calling post dot set, we can actually pass all of this data we've got here as the first parameter. So let's say we do var data is equal to an object and I can just turn this into an object instead of functions that we call. So let me do this, let me do this, this should be colon and finally num comments. Okay, and then let's comment this out. 
and you can actually pass that as the first parameter. So that's saying, so line six, we create an empty instance of post, an empty row. We don't create one, we define one there. And on the save function, we say, save this post object, but you update its columns with this data. And then we can also pass the success error callbacks on the second parameter. So that's another way of saving a post object, just by providing the data in the first parameter to the save function. So let me clear that now and hit run again, make sure it works. It looks like it's working. The object ID is different. So we know it's created a second post object. Now let's go to the parse dashboard. Sometimes when you create new classes, you have to hit refresh on the page to just to see it. So here we go. There's a post objects that we've been creating here. And you can see it's done a couple of things. A, it's automatically created the, the class the first time we try to save it. It's then detected from the fields that we tried to save on it, which columns we wanted to create. So it's created a tags column, a num comments column, and a body column. If you remember object ID, ACL, updated at, and created at our automatic columns. And it's finally inferred from the types of the values that we were sending in, what the type of this column is. So the num comments, because we sent in a number, it's then created a number based column. Tags, it's detected an array. So it's set an array based column. And then body was, it detected a string. So it just detected a string based column. Now this is important. So now if we try to do something a bit different, so let's say num comments, I set it as the word non, and let me try and save this. So now when I try to run this, oh, oops. So the first parameter to the error function is actually the object itself. And the second parameter is the error message. So let me just clear that and run it again. Okay, here we go. So now we've got an error. So it's saying schema mismatch for post num comments, expected number, but got string. So because the first time when we created this post instance, we had set the num comments as a number. Now every other time you save num comments, it's got to be a number. So that's a really useful feature of parse in that it kind of validates this as it goes along. So if in the future you tried to accidentally set none instead of a zero, it would give you an error rather than silently saving a string and moving forward. But it just means that you need to be careful the first time you create a class just to make sure that you've got the right data types for each field. And as well as that, it doesn't matter the first time you create it. If we wanted to create, if we added a field later on, let's say, let's say author, and let's call it a string, I mean, lowercase that. Now let me just clear and run it again. Okay, now if I go back to the parse dashboard, refresh, you can see it's actually added, oh, where is it added in? I'll have to refresh the page. Okay, there you can see it's added in a new column called author. And for the fields, for the instances which didn't have that author, it's now said it's undefined. But we saved on with an author and it saved it there. So, so with parse again, you can also add columns later on. You just can't change columns and change their data types, but you can add them later on and that's fine. If you needed to, you can delete a column. If, we, if you set it with the wrong data type, that's fine. Just delete it and just add it in again. So there you go, those are the different ways you can save or create an object or create an instance or a record in parse. And I've also showed you one method that parse gives you for running code after you've been, after it has been saved on the database. Another method that parse uses is with something called promises that results in cleaner and easier to understand code. And we'll go through that in another lecture.